this morning that I want to talk to you about. There's a process to provision. And I'm not talking about money for the most part. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We ask you, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, by your spirit that dwells in us who are saved. We ask that spirit to rise up in us, to rise those gifts about us this morning, Father. Lord, I ask you this morning to, to open our ears, our, our spiritual ears this morning and, and leave everything else aside. That we may hear the words this morning. Not my word, but your words, Father. Lord, I thank you and I praise you for it. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The process to the provision. That's what I want to talk to you about this morning. I want to talk to you this morning about all this process and provision. What's the process? It's something we do to get to what we want, if you will. Many in the body of Christ are frustrated with doubt and unbelief because it's not working for them. They don't understand how come God's Word not doing what they want to see happen in their lives. They're frustrated. I believe because they don't understand that there's a process to the provision of God. Everything, there's a process to precision in God. I made some extra notes, so I gotta make sure I don't miss them over here. Many want to be, many want a savior. Many of you want a savior. Keep you out of hell, right? How many want to say, heck yeah, I want a savior, keep you out of hell. But the problem is, many born again Christians who call themselves Christians don't want a Lord. There's a difference between a Savior and a Lord. Lord means He's your life, not you. Remember the scripture that talks about that we got to die to ourselves? He's talking spiritually speaking, but what He's saying is if you continue to run your life according to you and not according to the Word, you're gonna, all you're doing is believing in a Savior, not a Lord. That makes sense, everybody? Before we continue, I want you to know I'm not talking about financial this morning for the most part. I'm talking about the principles and promises of God have, which is a process which we must go through. Everything God said in His Word we got to do something to get to there. Everything. Now think about it this way. If a born-again Christian, one of these little babies just got born again, one of the older babies, and they just got born again, and God used them to raise the dead, do you think they would understand what happened? They wouldn't get it. I mean, God's speaking to them, sitting on their little chair there going, I need you to go over and lay hands on that because the pastor's getting ready to die. You really think they'd understand that? But how about you this morning? Would you understand that? You're sitting there and God says, your pastor's about to fall over. I need you to go lay hands on him so he'll live. Most of you just sit there. You know why? Because we think that it's us. It's not us. It's God. How many times have you been thinking about that lately? Probably none. That's what you've got to understand. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a process we have to go through. The bridge, and the process here is you've got to learn. You've got to read God's Word. You've got to study God's Word, not once a week. <clears throat> we must go through a process. I'll give you some examples so you can kind of understand where I'm going this morning. For instance, salvation. The process is we must believe according to uh, Hebrews, Hebrew, yeah, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews, take it right. I'll get it right here now. I'll tell you what it is here in Salvation. The process is we must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We must believe that Jesus was the Son of Man. We must believe He was born of a virgin. And He was resurrected on the third day. And He now sits at the right hand of the Father. The Bible says that's what we must believe to be saved. But all of God's Word is what we must do is the process. There's still a process here, isn't there? There's a process of salvation. If you don't believe those things, there's no salvation. Is there? Can't have it. 
A lot of people think salvation is a one-time event. It's not a one-time event. It's the beginning of a new era in your life. It's the beginning of, of conquering. It's the beginning of everything. He's waiting. Jesus is waiting at the, with the Father to go and get his church. I could go on and on about that this morning, all the things going on in our world today. People, we're getting there. We're getting close. It's unbelievable what's going on in the world. The process is we must believe before salvation comes. And how many really know that salvation is a provision of God? Think about it. It's a provision. Let me give you the biblical definition of the word provision this morning. I hate this thing. Number one. The act of providing, number one, is the act of providing or making per, uh, previous preparation. Measuring, take it, uh, measures, take it beforehand. So what we see here, it, it is much more than just saying a prayer and waiting on God. To bring us the answer. God's provision is, as I have always said, and I will continue to say, he said, if you will, God will. Some of us go and pray to God. We give him a prayer. And it's a, it's a prayer that requires a much. Maybe it's a, someone saved in your family. We pray one or two times, maybe three times, because the preacher preached a little message on it. Next thing you know, we're not praying for him no more. And you really expect God to answer that? You really expect that? He's looking for the faithful. And what he said in the beginning of his word all the way through, he's looking for the faithful. You stay faithful to that, to that prayer until you see the answer. You don't stop. You keep talking to him. You keep telling him about it. You don't mean you have to pray every time about it, but you keep reminding God that you want Uncle Joe saved. You don't give up on it. Maybe you got a wild child. You know, every time you got him, you know, you got to spank them or you got to, you know, uh, discipline them or everything else. And God, you ain't helping me none. You keep going after it. You keep praying. The story of Esther, I think, is probably, probably one of the best there is when it comes to talking about a provision. There was a process that the Israelite people had to go through during that day. And uh, in, order to, in order to be saved, not saved as in, in Christ, but to be saved from complete annihilation. They were going to kill her. They were going to kill all the Israelite people that had a plan, that had it plotted out, had everything happening. This plot was by Haman to kill and destroy God's people, the Israelites. But when the plot was discovered, the process the people went through they discovered the plot. You know, so they could have stopped right there and just, that's it. I guess we're annihilated. I guess it's over. God's not helping me. He's not, he's not part of my life. You know, you know, poor old me stuff that kicks in right about there. But no Esther, the queen. And you know, according to the story you read, that she, she took a, such a bold move that she could have been killed for what she'd done to get there to the process. People went through in order to be saved. And that was, they prayed and they fasted. And they believed. And we know the end of the story, they were saved. There was a process to that process too. To this Israelite being saved. Now if Esther and the people of Israel wouldn't have prayed and fasted, there would not have not been no provision. They've been wiped off. Now, God would have had another plan. We all know that. But that people would have been gone. That people would have been gone. Let's take marriage for an example. The Bible says we become one, right? And then what it says? One. 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 Boy, I could get on that quick. I ain't going to. The Bible says we become one. 
How many know there's a process to the perfect marriage? If indeed we are become one, there's something required of the man. There's something required of the woman. And that is the process. <coughs> you bring that bottle of water, please. Thank you. The Bible speaks of the man's responsibility. If you've been in my church very long, you know what that is. You've read it. I've shared it with you. told you where it's at and everything else. And a woman has her responsibility in the marriage also. And when we don't allow that process, we can't become one. That one, that one is the process. When we don't become one, we end up in divorce. We end up with mom and dad practically hating each other. Because mom and dad's not doing what God's word says. Because when you got married, I hope you got married under him. And if you didn't, you need to get married under him. If you did that, then you're saying to him when you got married, that I do according to the word of God. That's part of your vows. Jesus said, those who abide in him, in turn, God will make an abode with him. John chapter 15, it's all written right there. Which meaning he will live within us. And that's the process. If we have to abide to get to the provision, God will come and live in us. I say that. I want to rephrase that and make sure. Sometimes we think when we're here, you know, we ask you to Jesus to come live in our hearts. It's sort of kind of not really a true statement in reality. Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. The Holy Spirit comes to live in us. But how many know there's three in one? Okay, we've got to get that down so we don't get confused. But the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Jesus don't live in us. God don't live in us. The Holy Spirit lives in us. We have to, the Bible teaches that we have to, we have to die to the flesh. And we shall live. And that shall be the prophet. If we have to die, the provision is we should live forever with him. That means dying to our flesh. Taking the things of our flesh away from us. And growing and having a relationship in Him where we live by the Spirit. What's it say we live by the Spirit? That Jesus, God said that He will know that you are His sons and daughters if you live by the Spirit of God. You can't live by the Spirit and live by the flesh all the time. It won't work. That's what Jesus said. You're either hot or cold. You know, the worst place to be is lukewarm. You know what lukewarm is? It makes you comfortable. That's where a lot of the body of Christ are. They're comfortable. And Jesus said, look, I'd rather you be cold because at least I got a chance to get you back. But if you're living in the middle, which is warm and comfortable, then we don't like going outside that comfort zone. But God wants us to be hot. When I talk about dying, and I think I covered it good enough. It's talking about it in the spirit realm. It's not talking about it in the body. But the body will die. As the spirit goes in you and comes in you, your body will die to the fleshly things. You know what I mean? I've heard people say, well, you have to be a little too godly. You can't be too godly. Come on now. That's all they ever want to talk about when I'm around God. What's wrong with that? That's the way we're supposed to be. Is it not? Probably there's too many Christians acting like the world too much. That's the problem. Not enough like God and His Word. If we don't go to work every day and take care of our job, be on time, and do what we know we should do, we ain't going to eat. Isn't that right? Isn't that right? So many people take their job over church, take their job over his relationship and everything else. Which shouldn't be. We need to take care of our jobs and be on time and do what he wants us to do. We won't eat. It, won't be, it will be very difficult to eat and drive a nice cars, drive and drive nest nicely. We get all these things because of the process. 
Let me tell you a little story here. Some of you ain't gonna like this, but you know what? It's the word of God. I don't care how we look at it. How about giving our children a cool toy, a really cool toy they've been wanting forever? Or how about one of our teenagers buying a brand new latest iPhone, which I don't even know what it is, y'all. iPhone something. 14, 15, 16, I don't know what it is. All I know is it's well, $1,500. That's what I seen the other day. But how many of you teenagers would love to have a brand new iPhone? Oh, yeah. But what if they took that iPhone and that cool toy that you just bought them, and within a month or two, it was destroyed? The crane was all cracked and busted, and, and the toys all destroyed? How would that make you feel to mom and dad? Some of you, unfortunately, would go buy them another new one. But it works the same way with us grown-ups. You know that, guys? What about us grown-ups that don't take care of the things that God's given us, like our cars and, and our houses and, and everything that God's given us? We don't change the oil. We don't check the tires. We don't keep them clean and wash, make them look good. Because after all, what did it say in the Word of God? If they belong to God, they, if you belong to God, then that belongs to God. As long as you don't owe no money, now let me get that straight. Because your money on doesn't belong to God. It belongs to the bank first. Bottom line, you can call me whatever, but it's in the Word. I can read I can show it to you. <clears throat> so many people, Christian people, went out and come back buying their car and said, man, God helped me get that card. I said, would you get a loan on it? Yeah, well, God didn't help you. It's against His principles. How can He help you if it's against His principles, guys? He can't. He can't help you. We've got to take care of what God's given us. Our lawnmowers, keep the oil chain, keep the blades sharp. All those things are things that God, if we got them and God's given them, you know God gave them to us, we've got to take care of them. And don't expect another new one if you ain't. Don't expect another one if you're not taking care of what you already got. It just ain't going to happen, okay? You know where it talks about in the Bible that uh, Malachi 10 tells me, you know, if you give your tithe to, uh, to the church and... and uh, that uh, he opened the windows of heaven pour out blessings you can contain and blah, blah, blah. Well, let me tell you something. There's something tied to that a little bit. How can he pour out blessings that you can't contain when you're not taking care of what he's giving you? Ain't going to happen. You've got to take care of it. Throughout God's word, there are principles concerning this matter all through his word, everywhere you look. I preach message over message. This message is no very different this morning. I see people, good people, good people who, who have given their heart to the Lord, has big hearts. People who were struggling and scratching and fighting for the things of God. How many want to quit scratching and fighting for the things of God? The problem comes in, we believe that all we have to do is pray and somehow magically God will bring forth it without any process. I'm telling you the truth this morning. It will not happen. It will not happen. I'm teaching a very valuable principle this morning. Extremely valuable. God will bring it forth without any process on our part. God is not a genie nor a Santa Claus church. His kingdom is not set up as a free handout kingdom. Are you hearing me this morning? Unfortunately, most believers, most Christians that go back there, call themselves Christians, believe that God's free on handing out whatever they pray for without any process. It will not happen in your lives. There's a process. There's a process. There's a process. God's kingdom is not like our government where everything is an entitlement. How many of you about tired of all the entitlements? They're everywhere. Everybody's sitting on their butts. You know what? I, I thought it was great. Some people don't know that trick behind the new, the new $3,000 or whatever, $300 they're giving you every month. They don't know what the trick is going to be come January 1. 
The trick is you're still going to get charged. You're still going to have to, you, you won't get that 3,600 child credit no more off your taxes. It's gone. Most people don't know that. But what happened was, what was cool is, I think they said like seven or eight million people figured it out. They, they opted out of the whole program. So they figured it out. They figured they was trying to do something to trap them in. That's what they did. They trapped them. So they're going to give you another one in the spring. So you're, gonna, you're always going to be owing him something. Are you getting what they're trying to do to you? You're always going to be owing them this money. Period. That's what he's trying to do to us. Got off out of it. Or live with it one. Kind of like the process. That's what the government's doing. That process ain't it? Messing with you. God is a loving father. And a loving father doesn't just give his kids something for nothing, if you will. Don't happen. The Word of God teaches us about financial provisions. I think we're just about to get there in this church. I think we're almost there. Everybody's understanding how it works. And, they're, and, and they'll begin to see that, 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 that provision coming to them. If they'll continue, it doesn't happen overnight. But it happens sometimes over a period of time. If you look back on it, when you start tithing, you've been tithing for quite a while, you'll begin to see. Wow. Never thought about it. I ain't gone hungry since I started tithing. I ain't gone without. I ain't gone without no clothes. Think about it. This is if you give with a cheerful heart. He'll bring back to you God's provisions. The Bible says, press down, shaking together, runneth over. He says, if you give your time faithfully, not grudgingly, and not to worry about what the left and the right hand is doing in your giving, he says, he will open the winds of heaven because everything in our lives to prosper. I say all of these things, but see, most of us don't preach what to get in front of that, the prosper and everything will prosper, but you got to process. you got to process. So remember it this way, the double P's. Process provision, process provision, PP. PP. Boy, that don't sound good, does it? The letter P and the letter P, I guess I'll prevent that. That doesn't sound real good, does it? He wrote in the Word. Another good example of this is when the Holy Spirit came to those 120 in the, in the upper room. Remember what, what was the process of that one? They had to wait. They didn't know how long they were going to wait because God didn't tell them how long they had to wait. But they ended up waiting 50, 51 or 52 days before it came. Can you imagine 120 believers thrown in a room like this? Well, hopefully it's a little bigger than this. And, and everything else and told to wait till the Holy Spirit came. You know, they get tired of talking to each other. You know, they get tired of, you know, you can't imagine. They was no different than us. So you know they were grumbling, grunting, grumbling. You're a lot of them, you have to be. But they waited 100, 120 of them waited 50, 51 days, I think, what was. So if they wouldn't have went through the process, what would have happened? They would have never seen the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Would have never happened. See, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's something we have to do. There's a process to everything in God's Word. There are many in the body of Christ who love God with all their heart. The problem is they fail to go through the process to get to the provision. There are many who are going through the motions, but not the process. There are many homes in the body of Christ that are sick, if you will. Meaning sick, not in sickness necessarily, but that they got marriage problems, they got kid problems, they got this problem, they got that problem. They're one way at church, and they're another way at home. They figured out how to fool me, and but God, this is a powerful thing, God will not be mocked. Never will he be mocked. I didn't put the definition. Go look up the word mock. It's going to surprisingly shock each one of you. Look at the word of what mock means. He knows what's going on. 
He knows how you are at home versus how you are at church. He knows that. He knows. Somehow we think God is blind. The one who put the stars in the sky, gave us the moon to look at. Did y'all look at the moon last week? Like the first of the week, Monday or something? That dude was the brightest I've ever seen. Was it Monday? Yeah. Monday night? Oh my gosh, I couldn't even look at it like looking at a flashlight. It was amazing. Anyway, I seen it on the internet and I went and looked at it, waited so I could see it. It was beautiful. You couldn't even see the the, the land on it, the land mass. It was just one bright ball. It was beautiful. White, white as could be. Anyway. Many of the families are not going to go through the process. They know what the Word of God says about the family. They know what the they should be doing. They continue to live in their in, in their live in their lives, trying to skip the process, so they get to the provision of, of a godly home. It won't work. <coughs> we have to do it God's way. When we accept it and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, did we think we could continue to live our lives as, as if we were in the world? What do you think was going to happen? I'm going to go down there and get saved. The preacher's going to say a prayer. I'm going to get saved. I can continue to live the way I was. Well, that ain't the way it works because, for one thing, when you truly get saved, you will change. It takes time, it's a process, but you will change. Period. If you ask yourself this morning, have I changed because I'm working hard to make sure I've changed? Or did I change through freedom because God freed me? What, which one is it? That's a lot of word, ain't it? Which one is it this morning? Because most of us are very good at fooling people and even trying to fool God. But we're not very good at it because at a point it'll come and hit us right square in the heart. The Bible teaches us that if we live in the kingdom's kingdom, in the now. Do you hear me? In the now. And if so, we have to do it His way. The biblical way. We cannot do it the way the world does it. Do we get that understood? We have to, man, we've got to grasp hold to that church. We cannot do it the way the world does it. We are not of this world. If you're truly a born-again believer, you are not of this world. You're living here right now for a while. Abraham called it a tent. This tent I live in. Someone's got two or three windows in it. Someone's ain't got no windows at all. You get a hold of that here shortly. The Bible teaches us that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And that there no man can come to him except, no one can come to him except through Jesus Christ. No other way. That's a provision, isn't it? A whole lot of people want to go through him, get to him through, through Buddhism and all that other places and all that other way or get to him my own way. It don't work that way. The Bible says the Holy Spirit draws you to salvation. And then God's Word says He gives you faith to believe for salvation. You get saved. Then you got to start studying. Then you begin to pray. You begin to learn all these things. And set yourself in a place where you're hearing God's Word at home and everywhere and, and at, at church and everywhere else. Y'all heard me. I've told you this before about the water tower. I, I, think, I think of faith and believing like a water tower. Many of us know the Word of God for the most part. I can't quote it verbatim either, okay? But I know enough of it to get me through where I can get to where I need to get if I want to know the true scripture. But that's the water tower. So we got this water tower sitting over just full of faith. We don't know how to turn on the valve. We turn on the valve when you believe. When you believe. Because the Bible says faith without works is what? Dead. So you can have all the faith in the world. You can have that water tower overflowing. But if you don't have works with it, 
which is believing. Believing is meaning you're doing something besides praying to God and waiting on Him. You're doing something. That's the believing part. That's the process part. <clears throat> Can you see the process in this? Jesus is the way. I believe there are many this morning sitting in churches all over this world that are trying to get salvation in so many other ways than through Jesus Christ. And it's not possible. You can't get there. You can work your way, come to church and just work like a little busy beaver. A lot of people like to work. They really do. And they work and they look really good. And they fool the pastor. They fool the, fool the board. They fool everybody. But like I said, Jesus will not be mocked. You can do it all you want to. You can act Christianity all you want to. The question comes down this morning. Are you trying to get the provision without the process? Think about it. If you're willing, if you are willing, and you choose to be that lost and miserable, frustrated person, then stay the way you are if you have this problem. Stay there. But if you want to be an overcomer, if you want to be that person who, who takes faith and turns on the water valve and makes it believe, turns on the process and begin to see things happen in your life because you didn't have a hand in it. Except the work part. That's all your part is. Think about the Israelites when they crossed the, the Red Sea. They didn't have to hardly do anything. But Moses still had to put his staff in the water. If he would have never put his staff in the water, nothing would have happened. They would have been annihilated on this side of the river. But because he did something, the process, he stuck his staff in the water. He didn't know what to do. He walked up there and he went, okay, God, you know. And something that still small voice in him said, Stick your staff in the water. Many of us get that still small voice a lot in our lives, but we don't do nothing with it. That's part of the process. We learn from that. No, are you going to hit it right every time? Maybe not. But I would rather miss it than not do it at all, I promise you. And I have missed it many times in my life. We get so frustrated and miserable that deep down inside we're actually saying there's no real God. Because it's not working the way you thought. It's not working the way you thought it ought to work. Can I get it to you, through you? Your head and your feelings don't have nothing to do with how God works. Feeling will annihilate the truth every time. It's not working the way you thought. Remember this morning, God's stuff, God's kingdom, the things of God's kingdom, the work of God's kingdom is not about you. Period. You're a vessel that God is using, but it's not about you at all. When you begin to use you and I and me all the time, it's not about the church. It's all about you. How could God be in you? Like that. You give him no glory, give him no praise, but everything you talk about God, it's about me, what I did. I, we didn't, we is not in your vocabulary. We gotta think about that. It's the process. See, we, when we become born again, we, still, we do use I and we, but at a point, there's a time and a place where we begin to use we. Remember, this is the body of Christ, it's not just you. It's a body of Christ. I want you to see clearly this morning if you've been trying to get some place in God without the process, it won't work for you. There's a process that has to take place in your life. Some of you sitting here this morning are backslidden. You really are. I'm sorry, but Jesus came this moment right now. Before I get done this message and I'm just about there, would you go up? Where would you be stuck, here or there? 
you got to ask yourself. The Bible teaches us in the Word of God, I think it's in Galatians, Pastor uh, Patrick preached on it here a while back, I don't remember what time, about that the, the, the place there he talked about in there that in the, in the Word of God, I think it's in Ephesians, I think it is, that uh, we, we as Christians will know whether we're saved or we're not saved. We will know that. So if you're sitting there doubting and kind of thinking about it, you probably ain't saved. Or you're backslidden one. Whichever way you don't call it, I don't care. Either way, you're not going to heaven. So it's up to you. This message this morning is really about freedom. Because when we understand there's a process to the vision, and we go through that process as God's word detail to us, what we must do, and then we will find freedom. Freedom to serve God. Freedom to do the things of God. We don't have to worry about what we said over here. We've got to kind of cover that up because we didn't say that right. We've got to come over here. We don't have to worry about any of that no more. Because we're going to walk in freedom in Christ Jesus our Lord through the Holy Spirit. His words. His word this morning will set you free if you want to be set free. It's up to you. 